Well, good morning and welcome to our service today. Whether you're a regular at Blenheim or whether you're just joining us online, uh, you're very welcome with us this morning. Once again, of course, we're unable to meet together as a church as we'd like to. We're having to make do with this kind of virtual substitute instead. And maybe you're beginning to find that really hard. Perhaps for the first few weeks, you know, we were in a new situation. There was a bit of a adrenaline, perhaps, even a bit of excitement as we adjusted to something new. But now, of course, it's just wearying, isn't it? And we long for it to be over. Well, there's a psalm in the Bible written by someone who's exactly in that situation. It's Psalm 42. The writer of this psalm is longing to be able to gather to worship God again. Just listen as I read part of it. Listen to the the sense of grief and of, of longing as I just read the first few verses, Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. This psalm reminds us of the deep relationship that we have with God our Father through Jesus. The centre of our worship today is not as it was when that psalm was written at the temple. The centre of our worship of God is Jesus Christ. And we can worship God anywhere, we have access to him anywhere, whether we're in our homes or whether we're together. And yet there is something, isn't there, about gathering together as God's people that we miss, that we long for. And so Psalm 42 helps us. Longing and and grief and weariness at a time like this are natural. We can't see the end. We, We don't know when things will get better. But we put our hope in God. We praise him. He is our saviour and we can trust him. And so let's pray to him now. Let's pray to our God. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are our God and our Saviour, that we have an intimate, close relationship with you, even though we are just creatures and you are the Creator. Incredibly, we can call you our Father. We know that that is through the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has come into our world, that he has washed us clean on the cross and that you have adopted us as your children. We thank you for the hope and the confidence that that gives, that although many things are dark to us, we don't even know what tomorrow will hold, we live in uncertain times, we know that we can trust you, our Saviour. And so we pray that you would help us in the weariness in the longing for normal life again, in the grief for the things that we've lost and the things that we miss, help us, we pray, to hold on to you. We pray for those with particular needs in our church family. We pray for those who are undergoing chemotherapy this week. We pray that uh, they would know your presence close to them, your arms around them. Pray that that treatment would be successful in treating the cancer. We pray for those who have even more uncertainty now that restrictions are being eased a little bit and there's talk of that. For those who are having to decide about going back to places of work, those who make decisions for employees under them, for parents who have to decide whether to send children back to school or or to nursery, we pray that you would give them your wisdom and your peace. And we pray for ourselves today that as we hear your word, the Bible, that you would speak to us, speak peace and encouragement and words of reassurance to us. 
Help us to grow in knowledge and in love and in worship of you, O Lord. Amen. Well, as we were seeing last week, our hope is not just wishful thinking. Our eternal future is secure because it depends on something that has already happened in the past. Jesus died on the cross in our place to wash us. And so our hope is certain. And so we're going to sing of that now. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. The words will be on the screen, so please do join in or just listen to the music. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of my own I claim, but holy trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking. continuing to look today at Jesus teaching to his disciples on the night before he was crucified. And I'm going to read the next section of John chapter 14. So John's Gospel chapter 14 and we'll begin at verse 5. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? 
Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Well, in this part of of, uh, John's Gospel, Jesus' disciples are troubled and they're full of uncertainty for the future, and they're looking for reassurance. And that makes it particularly relevant and helpful in our situation, doesn't it? Jesus has just told these disciples that he is returning to his Father in heaven. He's going via the cross and the resurrection and ascending into heaven. And the disciples come to him with their questions. They want comfort. They want reassurance. And Jesus gives them that reassurance and comfort in a wonderful and profound way. And we're going to see that. We're going to learn from that and receive some of that reassurance ourselves this morning. And so the first question that they come to Jesus with is in verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus is going, he's going to heaven, he's just told his disciples that, and he's promised that he will take his disciples to be with him as well. But Thomas wants to know, how can we get there? How can we get to heaven? And that is something every one of us must know, isn't it? If there is heaven and there is hell, as Jesus says there is, then the most important thing we could possibly know is how to get to heaven, how to get to where Jesus is. And Jesus answers this question to Thomas in verse 6. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now maybe that's not what we expect Jesus to say. Maybe we expect him to say, I will show you the way. Watch me. Follow the way that I go and you will get to heaven. And that would mean, wouldn't it, that we would have to live a perfect life like Jesus. Or even that we would have to die on a cross, that we would face God's judgment and be raised from the dead. But Jesus doesn't say, I will show you the way. He says, I am the way. Because Jesus has died on the cross and been raised, He has become the way that we get to heaven. If we want to get to God, if we want to get to the Father, to heaven, then we must come through Jesus. The reason is that Jesus died in our place, bearing our sin on the cross. The judgment that our sins deserve fell on him. He has paid for them. And so through Jesus, we can be righteous and holy to enter the presence of a holy God. Only Jesus can do that. That is how, that is why he has become the way to get to God. He has become the truth about God and about how to to reach him. He has become life, eternal life, for all who come to him. And this is a great, great comfort, isn't it? It's a great reassurance to these troubled disciples and it should be a great reassurance to us. We don't have to live a perfect life. We don't have to climb up to heaven with our good deeds. And what a relief that is, isn't it? If we had to live a perfect life, if we had to achieve holiness ourselves, then we would have no hope. But we don't have to do that. We don't have to find our life, spend our life searching for some philosophy or some way or hoping that in the end we will make it. What is the way to heaven? 
Jesus is. And if we come to him, he will get us there. And Jesus makes it clear that he is the only way, doesn't he? That it is only those who come to God through him who will get there. He doesn't say, I am a way. He says, I am the way. And the second half of verse 6 makes that crystal clear. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. Now, that's very unpopular, isn't it, in this post-truth world that we live in. It is a, a very dearly held belief that all religions and no religions are equally valid. But I think that if we think about it just for a moment, that is not the way that we actually think about things. So imagine that I uh, asked somebody, how can I get to London? How can I get to London? Now, from where I am right now, as I'm recording this, the answer would be something like, uh, head east and you will get there. That's the way, just head east. But imagine I asked a range of people and I got a range of answers. One of them said, just keep on driving north. And the other one said, well, get on the M3, head towards Southampton. That's the way. A third one said, take a flight to New York. That's the way to get there. Now, we know, don't we, it really doesn't matter how sincerely I believe or they believe that that is the way to London. It doesn't matter how beautifully I drive or how well behaved I am along the way. Those things are not the way to get there and so I won't get there if I take them. And it's the same with heaven. It doesn't matter how sincere or devout you are. It doesn't matter how good living and moral you are, how beautiful your life looks. It doesn't matter how much you believe that your way ought to get you there. Jesus says that he is the way and no other way will work. And so let me ask you this morning, what are you relying on to get you to heaven? Nothing could be more important than that, could it? Perhaps you're relying on your good deeds in the end and outweighing your bad deeds. Perhaps you follow another religion and you're relying on that. Perhaps you're relying really on just a vague hope that it will all kind of turn out in the end. Jesus says that it will not be all right in the end. You will only get to God if you come via him. You see, Jesus is both the most exclusive and the most inclusive person. He is exclusive in that you can only come through him. No other way will do. But he is inclusive in that anyone can come through him. It doesn't matter what your religious or cultural background is. It doesn't matter how good you've been, whether you're young or old, male or female. It doesn't matter whether you've done terrible things in the past. You can't have blown your opportunity to come to Jesus. Anyone who trusts in Jesus to bring them to God will get there. That is Jesus' promise, his reassurance to us this morning. And so have you come to him? So Jesus shows us he is the way to God. But the second thing that Jesus teaches his disciples and teaches us in these verses is even more profound. In verse 8, another disciple, Philip, asks Jesus another question. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. I guess Philip is thinking, come on, cut to the chase, enough of all this, this talk. Just give us a glimpse of God. That's all we ask for. That will, that will set us up for life. And Jesus' answer is astonishing. Verse 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is teaching us here that he is not just the way to God, Jesus is God. Now imagine that you wanted to see a, a famous person, let's say you wanted to see the Queen, and so you said to somebody, I want to see the Queen. And this person shows you a photo of the Queen. 
Would you be satisfied with that? Would you think you'd seen the Queen then? Well, no, I don't think you would, would you? You realise that actually you, you want something a bit more than just a photo. So imagine that the person you're talking to says, well, actually, I make my living doing impressions of the Queen. And I'm actually very good. Let me put my costume on. And once you've seen me, you will have seen the Queen. Well, that's a bit closer, isn't it, I suppose. But I don't think any of us would say that we'd really seen the Queen once we'd seen someone doing an impression of the Queen. What we'd need to say that we'd seen the Queen was either to see the Queen or to see someone who is absolutely identical to her. The same looks, the same voice, the same personality, the same decisions, so that you couldn't tell the difference. So that what this person did was exactly what the Queen would do. And of course, no two people are that similar, are they? Not even identical twins are as similar as that. And so do you see how amazing it is when Jesus says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. He is claiming, isn't he, to represent God the Father perfectly, so that if you have seen him, you don't need to see the Father. Now, how can Jesus say that? He's not claiming to be like another person. He is claiming to be identical with God. The only way that Jesus can say that is that if he is God, isn't it? And Jesus goes on. In verse 10, he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Now, the point here is not to try and kind of visualise how can one thing be in another and that same thing be in the other one. And the point is that God the Father and God the Son are perfectly united. They're not the same and yet they're so perfectly intertwined and united that you can't separate them. You can't work out where one begins and the other ends almost. And that means that the words that Jesus says and the things that Jesus does are not just him saying and doing them. They're God the Father living in him, doing his work. Now you've probably realised that what we're looking at here is what's called the Trinity. That is, that there are three persons who are God, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And yet there are not three gods. They are so perfectly united that there is one divine unity, that God is one. Now that's something that we have to, to wrestle with, isn't it? To get our, our little brains around. God is so much greater than us that actually it's not surprising, is it, that we can't fully grasp what he is like. But Jesus says these things not to uh, stretch his disciples' brains, but to reassure them in their trouble. And so let's just ask this morning, why is it good that God is like this? And there are lots of reasons that we could talk about. It is a very good thing that God is like this. It is only because God is like this that we can be saved. But let's just think of one reason together this morning. It is only a God like this that we can see and know. Philip has asked to see the Father. If you know the Old Testament in the Bible, you'll know that the closest anyone ever got to seeing God was when God passed in front of Moses. But Moses was not allowed to see God's face. He was only allowed to see well, his back or kind of, kind of the glow as he passed by, if you like. It's, it's sort of mysterious exactly what Moses could see. But in some way, God was hidden from him. But because Jesus is God, he perfectly reveals the Father. Philip has asked for a glimpse of God, but actually he's already got something much better, isn't he? For the last three years, he has had the exact image of God living right there with him. In Jesus Christ, God has become one of us, taken on humanity, lived on earth, experienced what we experience. We know that God understands. 
He doesn't just know about what we experience, he has been through it himself. And so he is able to sympathise and to help. He is a God who we can know. And as we believe Jesus' words, we come to know him. We come to see what he is like. And one day we will see him, we will see God face to face, something that nobody in the Old Testament had. I guess we find it hard to understand how God can be three persons in one God, but it is the most glorious good news that he is like that. It is because he is like that that we can know him. It is only a God like that who can save us and who we can relate to. So we've seen great reassurances already. We've seen that Jesus is the certain way to God. We've seen that through Jesus we can see God, we can know God. And then thirdly, Jesus reassures us with amazing promises. Have a look at verse 12. Jesus says there, verse 12, I tell you the truth, <clears throat> anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus promises that those who believe in him will do the things that he has been doing. Literally, he says, will do the works he has been doing. Now this verse has often been used to claim that Christians should be doing incredible miracles. They should be healing the sick, they should be giving sight to the blind, they should even be raising the dead. Some Christian teachers have claimed that. That is what Jesus did, they say, and Jesus said we should be doing greater things than that. But even though Christians have done a good deal of, of, of good things in founding hospitals and healing the sick and so on, I don't think what the, that's what this verse is talking about. We need to look carefully at what it says. We need to think, what are these works that Jesus has been doing? Well, we see that word uh, a number of times in these verses. First of all, in verse 10, Jesus says to his disciples there, the words I say to you are not just my own, <clears throat> rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work, or doing his works in fact. You see there that Jesus' works are tied up with the Father's works. It is not just Jesus' works, but the Father's works through him. And they're also all about Jesus' words. What Jesus says is the Father's works. And then we have the word again in verse 11. The translation uh, I read from is a bit confusing because rather than the word works, it has the word miracles. But the word is actually works there. Verse 11, Jesus says, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. And he says that his people will do the same works but greater. So what are Jesus' works? Well, when we put all the, the kind of clues from these verses together, we see that Jesus' works are the same as the Father's works. And they are speaking words that bring people to faith in Jesus. That is the work that the Father is about. He is about saving people through belief in Jesus. And we see that repeated through John's Gospel. John's Gospel speaks of God's works in a number of places. So in chapter 5, God's work is giving life. In chapter 6 of John, God's work is to believe in Jesus. And in chapter 9, God's work is separating out those who see the truth about Jesus from those who are blind to him. And so when we put all that together, we see that God's work is to give life to people who believe in Jesus. To give them sight and faith and understanding of who he is. And that is what Jesus has been doing too. And that is what Jesus says that his people will do. That they will speak words about Jesus that bring life. 
As we tell people about Jesus, God opens blind eyes. People believe in Jesus and they have eternal life. That is the work that God calls us to, that Jesus says that we will do. And that is a work, isn't it, that we can do even greater things in than Jesus did. When Jesus ascended to heaven, there were probably around 500 people who believed in him. But since then, through the work of God's people, billions have come to believe in Jesus and to have life. And there's a second wonderful promise as well in verse 13. Verse 13, Jesus promises, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Now again, this is another verse that's very easy to misunderstand, isn't it? A few weeks ago, we were looking at uh, a promise like this with the children at home. And I said to them, if you ask God for a Ferrari, it doesn't mean that he will give it to you. And Nathaniel, our youngest, asked, why won't God take you to the zoo? Which was a bit puzzling. We had to think about it. But eventually we worked out that he thought I'd said, God won't give you a safari if you ask him. But of course, that's not the only way to misunderstand this verse, is it? Uh, maybe you've heard people on TV teaching us to, to name it and claim it. If you want a Ferrari or even a safari, then ask God and it's yours. Just say it and claim it. After all, isn't that what the verse says? But notice that Jesus says we are to ask in his name. That's not just a, a phrase that we stick on the end of prayers. It means that we're to ask in line with who Jesus is. We're to ask in line with his will. And notice too that Jesus promises to do whatever will uh, bring glory to the Father. It is very unlikely, isn't it, that us having a Ferrari will glorify God. It's much more likely to glorify us. But having kind of got all those, what Jesus is not promising out of the way, let's not miss what Jesus is promising because this is hugely encouraging. As we do the work of speaking about Jesus, holding out the offer of eternal life, warning people whose eyes are blinded to the truth, Jesus will give us anything we truly need. Anything that will lead to God being glorified is ours if we will ask. It's a wonderful promise, isn't it? As we share the good news about Jesus with our family and our friends and our neighbours, as we do that as individuals, as we do it as a church, we should be eager to pray, shouldn't we? We should be full of confidence that God will answer our prayers and give us what we need, that God will glorify his name. God has promised that he will do that. And so this morning we have these three great reassurances from Jesus. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Come to him and he will get you there. Jesus is the only way to know God. Believe in him and you will see. And Jesus sends us on a mission and he promises to equip us with everything that we need, that we will do greater works of bringing life even than Jesus did. Let's rejoice in him and let's pray. Our God and Father, we praise you for these great comforts, these great assurances of Jesus to his disciples, to his people in their times of fear and trouble and uncertainty. We thank you that Jesus is the way, that he has become the way to you, to heaven, by dying on the cross to wash us of our sins. We thank you for that certainty that any of us who come to him, who ask him and trust him, that he will get us there. We thank you for this amazing revelation that Jesus is God, taken on human form, become one of us so that we can know him and see him 
and be with him forever. What a wonderful comfort and joy that is. We thank you that you are a God like that who we can know. And we thank you that as we wait for that time, you give us these wonderful reassurances, these promises that as we speak about Jesus, people will receive life as they trust in him. That whatever we need to glorify you, you will give to us if we ask. Help us to be eager to pray, to seek your help, to seek to glorify your name, because we ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for your glory. Amen. Well, let's sing glory to God together now. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, glory be to God the Father. Let's sing. Glory be to God the Father, glory be to God the Son, glory be to God the Spirit, great I am the three in one. Glory, 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 while eternal ages run. Glory be to Him who loved us, washed us from each guilty stain. Glory be to Him who brought us, made us kings with Him to Glory, 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 glory to the Lamb who once was slain. Glory to the King of Angels, glory to the Church's King, glory to the King. Of nations, heaven and earth, your praises bring glory, 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 glory to the King of glory. Bring glory, blessing, praise eternal, bless the choir. Its praise creation brings glory, 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 glory to the King of Kings. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.